seated. Turn with me and a story to a story in the historical books, uh, Second Kings. Second Kings, you have Joshua, Judges, and then you roll on uh, First, Second Samuel, and First, Second Kings. Second Kings, chapter four. Second King, Second Kings, chapter four. We are two weeks before Thanksgiving. It's a week from this coming Thursday. I wanted to do a couple of messages focusing on the need not only for Thanksgiving, but for thanks living, living a lifestyle of giving thanks to the Lord God. So let's begin our reading at verse 1. Hear now the word of God. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children, to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in the house? And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. And then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons, and pour into these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. The idea here is then bring another one in. So she went in from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And she poured and they found uh, they brought vessels to her. When the vessels were full, said to her son, bring me another vessel, and said, well, there's not another one. See, they were all full. Then they all stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Keep your Bibles open before you. We're going to go back into this story and look at it. Let us look to God in prayer. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this story. Lord, we pray that this story will not only focus upon the one we need to focus upon, but also that it would give us many good reasons to be thankful to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just this past week, I came across a number of studies by a number of Christian writers that said, and these, these are people who study cultural trends, and they say that the fastest growing religion in the world is self-worship. Self-worship. Actually, it always has been. You know, since that tragic fall day in Genesis 3, our primary focus always tends to be the focus on the person we see in the mirror or the focus on the person we see in those selfies we take, namely ourselves. Now, I remember growing up at Bay Street Presbyterian Church and hearing a sermon on this particular uh, part of Scripture, and the guest preacher at that time came in, and I still remember this. He, he looked at verse 3, and he talked about the... You know, bring as many vessels as you can and set them aside. And he said, now, I want you to understand that to the degree we are in the condition of being empty to ourselves, to that degree, the Holy Spirit will fill us with himself. And then he said, after all, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, right? Well, afterwards, at lunch at our house... Dad decided to have Rose Preacher. And he said, now, now, I enjoy stories about Elisha. He was bold. He was bald. He said, I can identify with one of those. He said, but let me ask you this. Is the widow lady here being told to go out and sell the Holy Spirit in order to pay her debts? That would be the conclusion, and the problem is this. 
See how easy it is to take this story and put this poor lady and what she does at the center of the story. Now friends, this story does feature a helpless, nameless lady, two unnamed sons. It does feature them, but this story is primarily about Yahweh, the Lord, our covenant Lord. If this story was an ocean, the Lord would be the anchor point. If this story was a wheel, the Lord would be the hub of the wheel. If this story was a simple sentence, the Lord would be the subject of the sentence. In other words, yes, this story is a gift to us, but this story is first and foremost about the Lord God and how the Lord God helps His people. Even when we are marginalized and living in a fallen, broken, unfair world. In other words, this story, by pointing to the Lord, motivates us to give thanks to the Lord because the Lord helps us. Our Lord is a helping, hope-giving God, and we are thankful. So let's take two looks at this story. The first look is this. Notice in the first place, we, we see the desperate condition God's people sometimes face. That's the first thing we see in this story. The desperate condition God's people sometimes face. We could say, looking at verse 1, that this lady was flat broke and flat desperate. I've heard that term, flat whatever. It comes from the mid-1800s. It carries the sense of being completely or downright broke. Completely desperate. This woman is receiving, think about it, look at this verse, verse 1, a double dose of desperation. This lady, her husband, a servant of the Lord, has passed away. She's about to lose her two sons. Two young boys are about to be hauled off by her creditors into debt slavery to pay off what must have been a significant and sizable debt. You know, for 23 years, David Letterman featured a segment on his show called Letterman's Top Ten List. Came across the other day a popular top ten list from David Letterman. It's the top ten signs that you know you're broke. Top ten signs you know you're broke. Number ten. Number ten, the way you know you're broke is American Express card calls and says, by all means, do leave home without it. Number nine. The way you know your flat broke is this. You're formulating a plan to rob a food bank. Number eight, cell phone companies do not call you to switch to their company. Now you've heard the term uh, taking from Peter to pay Paul. Number seven, you rob Peter and then you rob Paul. Number six, I've done this. You finally clean your house in the hope that you might find some loose change. Number five, you think of a lottery ticket as an investment. Now, some of the, these next two may date us somewhat, but you'll know what I'm talking about. Number four, way you know you're broke is your, your baloney has no first name, not even O-S-C-A-R. <laughs> Number three, Sally Struthers sends you food. Number two, McDonald's supplies you with all your kitchen condiments. The number one way you know you're really broke is this. At communion, you go back for seconds. <laughs> this lady could see herself in Letterman's top ten list. And more. This lady would be, as they say down here in the Deep South, more broke than the Ten Commandments. As poor as a church mouse, a homeless rat. She's dealing with the difficult aftermath of her husband's death and now this destitution. She is flat broke and flat desperate. But notice here, there's an aggravation in this desperation. He says, you know, look at verse 1, you know that your servant feared the Lord. Think about that. Now, if you read about the politics in Elisha's time, if you didn't buy into the religious status quo of the day, Religion that praised the liberals as the clergy preached from the pulpit whatever the government was pushing. And at the same time, the, these liberal pulpits were going off against those backward, redneck, 
fundamentalist, you know, those troublemaking Yahweh worshipers. So they would target people who were faithful. This lady's late husband did not fear being the bullseye for the arrows of accusation and scorn, constantly being launched at all true believers in Yahweh. Notice she says, he feared the Lord. He swam against the stream of his culture, against the stream of his government, against the stream of the popular religion of his day. And yet for all her husband's faithfulness in the past, here in the present, this lady and her children face certain financial disaster. Friends, let me ask you something. Do you not feel the rub in verse 1? This faithful but oppressed. Doesn't this idea pop up in so many of our lives? Think of a Christian woman who served the Lord all her life and her cancer once in remission has returned with a vengeance. Or here's a Mississippi Delta farmer who openly confesses Christ and has, yet his crops have failed two years running. Now there's oppressive draconian government regulations smothering him and this man's about to lose his farm. And here's this Young Christian father who was in his 30s, healthy. He died of COVID. And now he leaves behind a wife and three young children. You see what she's saying? I'm a believer, but I'm living in desperation. What gives? Yet this desperate, aggravatedly desperate person Notice there's faith here. Notice she cried, verse 1, cried to Elijah. Cried to Elijah. What, you know, what, what? She cries out. Doesn't say exactly what she says. She certainly cries out. She lays her problem before God's servant. She doesn't suggest a solution. You don't read that here. Yeah, you know, perhaps Elijah, you could call a few, few of your well-to-do friends and raise some money for me. Oh, and by the way, Baldy, here's another suggestion. You could do this. No, you don't see that in verse 1. What you see is faithful people simply lay out their problems before the Lord, before the Lord's people. We don't recommend, we don't recommend, we don't advise the Lord what to do. You know why? Because our God, according to Ephesians 3, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask and think. We just need to verbalize our desperation to the Lord. Like Mary and Martha did to Jesus. In John eleven three, 3, Lord, the one you love is sick. That's what they said. Not, hey, Jesus, you got a special medicine to pull your friend out of the ditch and put him back on the road to recovery? No, listen, when we're desperate, we don't advise the Lord. We don't tell him what to do. We just lay out our burdens. We cast our burdens on the Lord. So let me ask you, how does what we've seen so far motivate us to give thanks to the Lord? Well, here's, here's how. We give thanks to the Lord because even when we find ourselves in times of deep trouble, we can still cry out to the Lord. And we can share our burdens with God's people. Listen, whatever your status is, however desperate your problem is, right now, because of the work of Jesus Christ, your great high priest, the bridge builder between you and God, you enjoy, now hear this, you enjoy the privilege of access to God. 24-7, you're welcome to bring your troubles directly to God. Jot this verse down, Psalm 142, verse 2. I pour out my complaints before God and tell God all my troubles. 
Do you? We see the kind of desperation even Christians face sometimes. Please understand, being a Christian doesn't vax you against trouble and difficulty. But as we take a second look at this story, we, we see something else. We see the fingerprints of God all over the solution to our desperation. We see the fingerprints of God all over the solution to our desperation. This is in verses 2 through 6. Notice what it says. Uh, what shall I do for you? What do you have in your house? It says your servant has nothing except a jar of oil. Now, notice here what you see in this verse, these verses, verses 2 through 6. It's how the Lord God tends to work in our lives when we're facing difficult, troubling times. And this is not a pattern. I mean, this is not a, well, this, it's a pattern. It's not, it's not something that God is obligated to do. Think about football. In my days, many of you remember this, something called the triple option. Quarterback could hand it off to the fullback. He could run around the end. He could pitch it off to the trailing halfback, or he could drop back and pass. Now you have the run-pass option. And the coach will tell you that that's the pattern. You're not locked into what you are obligated to do on any particular play. And that's the idea. Pattern's there. No obligation. Friends, when God is our quarterback, he's free to do whatever he wants to do. But sometimes you read a story like this, you read other stories in the Bible, and what you begin to see are some tendencies of God's ways, of how God deals with desperate people. And when you see what God is doing, you begin to give thanks for the way the Lord tends to work in our lives. He's not obligated to work in this way, but he tends to do so. Notice where God tends to begin. Notice, he says, what do you have? Your servant has nothing except a jar of oil. It's amazing how some very optimistic people look at verse 2 and say, oh, look what the widow said. I see a jar of oil. Praise the Lord. He's, he's given me a widow's helper starter kit. It's not what's being said. He says, I have, she says, I have nothing except this one thing. This one measly jar of oil signifies this lady's destitution. She has so little to offer. This meager jar of oil tells you how helpless and how hopeless this lady is. Yeah, think about it. The very item here in verse 2 that symbolizes her helplessness might also symbolize the means by which God may help her. This item, this jar, symbolizes her helplessness, but it also may symbolize the means God is going to use. If you, if you drive to Enterprise, Alabama, I wouldn't recommend it as a destination, but if you're driving through Enterprise, Alabama, you may want to pay attention to a particular memorial it is a memorial to, of all things, a bold weevil. Why? Well, here's why. Back in 1910, the bold weevil was to the main crash crop, a cash crop in Enterprise what a wrecking ball is to a building. The bold weevil literally wrecked the cotton industry in Enterprise, Alabama. And so in desperation, farmers turned to raising peanuts, corn, hay, and livestock. And then, amazingly, with all this diversification, the economy of enterprise stabilized and the community began to prosper. And the bold weevil became, for the town of enterprise, both a symbol of their destitution and the beginning of their recovery. Here we have one and only one jar of oil the very picture of destitution, but God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think with something we consider to be utterly insufficient. 
So the Lord tends to remember that. The Lord tends to begin with our insufficiency. Also, though, notice in verses 3 through 5 how the Lord tends to conceal. Notice, it says, Go outside, borrow vessels from your neighbors, empty vessels, not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons. Notice that. Shut the door. Why the secrecy? Why not all the hullabaloo, fanfare, live webcast, religious rah-rah over this marvelous provision the Lord's going to bring? Well, you know, maybe it might be that there's sometimes we don't need to make God's provision the subject of our testimony at a Christian women's club luncheon. I'll tell you why. Have you noticed how pride is a subtle backdoor glory thief. Someone stands before a crowd, tells this moving story about how the Lord provided for me. Or they decorate their stories with a heaping helping of cliches about all the glory belongs to the Lord because of what He did for me. This week, so looking forward to returning to our Thanksgiving feast and testimony time. Please think about standing and giving your testimony, but remember, the person you're magnifying in your testimony is not you. It's the Lord. It is the Lord. He occupies the prime real estate of your testimony. And friends, making the Lord what the Lord has done for you and making what the Lord has done is subtle. It's very significant. Then notice how the Lord tends to reward obedience. Verses 5 and 6 says, So she went from him, shut the door behind her sons. She poured, um, as she poured the lady, uh, they brought the vessels to her. The vessels were full. She said, Bring me another vessel. I said to her, they're full. There's not another one. Now, again, I have to circle back to this, this preacher that visited that day. He really beat up on this widow in verse 6. You know, he said, Why won't you know if this woman had just gotten more jars, she would have gotten more oil. What this lady needed was more faith. What we need is more faith. You don't have enough faith, do you? Well, friends, that'll preach if you're a preacher who enjoys beating up on your congregation. This story does not say anything about this lady's lack of faith. What this story does say is something about the fact that this lady obeyed the Lord and the Lord provided you see, in this story, please understand, God is pulling this lady into the process of building her faith as she obeys the Lord. And friends, as we obey the Lord, in the process of our obedience, our faith grows. So ask yourself this morning, is my faith growing and if your faith is not growing, perhaps you need to ask a second question. Am I obeying the Lord? You see, your faith grows in the fertile soil of your obedience to the Lord. Now, look at verse 7. I love this verse. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your son can live on the rest. What a great verse. Notice this verse tells us of God's overflowing kindness to his people. Isn't it just like the Lord to do more than we ask? Isn't it just like the Lord to meet our present needs and our ongoing needs? And because God meets our needs today and tomorrow... We have every reason to be filled with praise to the Lord for His provision. Our cup overflows with goodness and mercy. Now, before we, we leave this story, 
Yes, verse 7 does point to God's overflowing kindness to his people, but it points us to something else. I want you to understand something about the original audience this, this book is written to. This story is written to a nation of people that are experiencing the tragedy and difficulty of life in exile. In other words, this story is written to people like us. We are living in exile in a fallen world. In the words of the great old spiritual song, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world of woe. We're living in a world filled with tragedy. A world where suffering and tragedy and not having what we need is, it's, it's so normal. We just sort of come to expect that the hardest part of, of life is the living of it. But let us never forget this story is part of a larger story of Elisha's ministry in which we see, as you look at these, these miracles, all through this, beginning with chapter 4, what you see is the Lord's power triumphs over debt, death, drought, disease, and difficulty. As we see the inevitability of the Lord's great power for our good, we see even more. You see, and the something more we see is this. In all the miracles recorded in 2 Kings, all the miracles recorded in the Bible, you know what the miracles are there for? It's to remind us to look ahead to that day in the future. One day in the future when all debt, all disease, all drought, all difficulty will no longer exist. Beloved, Jesus is returning to this earth. And according to Revelation 21, Jesus is bringing with him a new heaven and new earth. And listen to what Revelation 21 says about what Jesus is bringing with him. Jesus will wipe every tear from our eyes. Think about that. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. See, the day is coming when everything that was lost will be restored. And then some. Forever. Think about that. God's provisions for today and the very brightest of hope for tomorrow and the new heavens and new earth where everything that was said will become untrue. Friends, the formula has always been this. Our desperation plus God's provision equals thanksgiving. Is that the equation of your life? Our desperation plus God's provision equals thanksgiving. I pray that that is the case for you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you meet us at our point of desperation. And Lord, however desperate our situation is, and sooner or later, we will all be desperate. However desperate our situation is, Lord, you tell us to, to cry out to you. Lord, that, that your, your office is open 24-7, that we have access to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that when it comes to providing for us, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think. You're not locked into a pattern, but you are free to minister to your people. And Lord, help us to see that, that one of the ways that you build our faith is by drawing us into a life of obedience. Lord, may our faith grow as we obey more. 
And Lord, give us a mindset that understands that everything we see in the Bible, every miracle that we see in the Bible, is a, it's a preview of upcoming attractions when you will make all things new and all things will be restored. Lord, we look forward to that day. We look at your provisions in the past. We look at the future. Lord, how can we help and give you thanks for all things? Help us to be a thankful people. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.